Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll start the service. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you for the <clears throat> opportunity to be here today. And Lord, we thank you for the time of fellowship, Lord, for the time around your word. And Lord, I pray that you be with the afternoon service as we just study more about uh, what you're doing in this present time, Lord, and, and about the kind of church that we want to be. Lord, help us to learn from the churches that you've represented here in, in the book of Revelation. Lord, help us to learn from their both their victories and their failings. And Lord, help us to be a stronger church as a result. In your name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Last week, we started, uh, we started studying through the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And uh, today, we're going to continue that study. I want you to look, we're going to, read, we're going to read about the second church. It's in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to start in verses 8 through 11. I just asked you to sit down, but why don't we stand back up? We'll kind of play up and down and keep our, keep up our digestion a little bit, you know, and uh, keep us awake. So now everybody's sleeping on me, okay? After, after lunch, you know, everybody wants to go to bed. So okay. <laughs> everyone wants to take a nap. At least I do, okay? Maybe it's just me, but I get to stand up. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, starting in verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blaspheme of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of the, those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that we ye may know, I'm sorry, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. You may be seated. As we look at this passage right here, uh, we want to start by just kind of having a quick review about last week. Okay, so last week we looked at the first church, okay, the church at Ephesus. And um, we also discussed the fact that, you know, there's seven churches, if you, seven churches that are, have these messages sent to them at the first chapter two and chapter three of the book of Revelation. Now, as we consider that, we, we can understand if you, I know a lot of you weren't here last week, but let's just look at it real quickly because the book of Revelation has a nice, neat outline. A lot of people look at the book of Revelation and they're like, what is going on here? Because I mean, it's just like, it'll blow you away when you read through it. But the Bible actually gives us kind of a little bit of a framework to help us understand what we're studying. So if you look at in Revelation chapter one, verse 19, Let's read uh, verse 19 together. It says, write these things. Christ is talking to John, telling him what he's supposed to write. Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Okay, so there you have a three-part outline for the whole book of Revelation. Jesus tells John, Listen, write the things you've seen. Well, the things he had seen at that point were the revelation or the glorified Christ. And that's in chapter one. In chapter one, if you read through chapter one, you're going to see Jesus Christ glorified. If you remember, if you remember in the New Testament, there's at a point, Jesus takes three of his disciples, John, James, and Peter, up on a mountain. And the Bible says that before, before them, he was glorified, okay? If you want to know what he looks like, chapter one of the book of Revelation tells you exactly what he looked like, okay? You remember they fell down on their, on their faces and they thought maybe they should make a temple or actually they thought they should make three tabernacles to honor because the Bible says that Moses and um, Elijah, Elijah were there and uh, he thought, they thought maybe we should make three and he said, no, you know, God said, hear my son and stop, you know, that's not what the whole point was. They this were supposed to see him glorified. So if you want to know what they, he looked like, it's found in chapter 1. Okay? The next part of this is write the things which are. Okay? And that's found in chapter 2 and 3. And that is the churches. Okay? Where are we at right now in this age? Right now. 
God is primarily working through the church. Okay? The Jewish nation at this point right now as a whole, as a nation as a whole, has not turned to God. It doesn't mean that Jewish people don't turn to God, but as a nation as a whole, they, they, they of course say they are following God, but the truth is they're not. Okay? So they have not turned completely to God. Okay, so understand that at this time, God is working through the churches. And I'm not, what I'm saying church is, notice I'm saying church is through the local church, okay? And I stress that because a lot of people get this idea that we have to have some like universal church, okay? There is no universal church in the Bible. I know some people are going to be, oh, hold on, there is a universal church that's made up of all the believers. God always deals with the local assembly, okay? Now think about this. Now th follow me for a minute. I'm just gonna, this wasn't even in my notes, but you get this as a bonus, okay? Okay, now think about this. When will all the believers be, meet in one place? When all the believers of all ages, where will they meet in one place? It's gonna be in heaven. You know what? We'll all be local then. You know? <laughs> It'll be the local body of believers, okay? It'll be all of us, but we'll be local. And if you study through the New Testament, if you study through the New Testament, you'll see that throughout the New Testament, God is always dealing with local bodies of believers, okay? Because the truth is we can't work as a, you know, people talk about universal church. You can't work as a universal church, okay? There's no such thing. Okay, God always works as a local body of believers. And that is why... That is why you see here he's dealing with these are these seven churches are literally seven local bodies of believers. OK, he's not dealing with them all together. He's dealing with each one of them individually. And there are seven literal local bodies of believers that existed. Now get this at the same time. Now, I know a lot of people when they talk about the seven churches, they 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 talk about the prophetic you know, what they believe is prophetic. And I, I'm not going to go. Th there's some reasons why I, it, it may be prophetic, okay? I, I, I will grant that it could be a prophetic thing. But you know what? God doesn't tell us what that is. And so where I stand is this. If God does not give a definite answer, I will not stand and say emphatically that this is what this means. Does that, does he understand what I'm saying? If I can't see it in the word of God, I'm not going to stand on it, okay? Because it could be. You know, some people say, well, Brother Daniel, do you believe that this... Because a lot of people teach that these seven churches represent seven ages during the church age, okay? I'll explain to you one, one reason, one of the reasons, and I'm not bashing them. Listen, it could be. Are you listen to me? It could be. I just can't emphatically say that it is, okay? And one of the reasons I say that is this. God, number one, doesn't say it in the Bible, okay? Number two, the, that, the idea of seven church ages within the church period was first put forth in writing. The first time we know of it in writing is about 800, 800 AD. And you know what? The man who, who wrote that, he believed he was part of the Laodicean church. Okay? He believed he was part of the Laodicea church. So that tells me that he could look back even at his time and he could say, well, I can see this and I can see this and I can see this. So as we fast forward almost... 1,200 years later, you know what? We're saying the same thing. We're in the La well, either we've been in the Laodicean church age for a long time, or it may mean that, but we just cannot emphatically say that. Does everybody understand? That's why I'm emphasizing that these were seven literal churches that existed at the same time, and guess what? These churches are types of churches that exist today. These same seven churches exist today. And actually, John, we were sitting at lunch, and he was telling me about the churches in Nigeria. And you know what? Today, we're going to talk about the church at Smyrna. And actually, you're going to see, John would be, would be able to tell you that it is a lot like what's going on in Nigeria, where there's persecution, where people are being killed for their faith. Okay? And so while we may not be experiencing it here locally, there are people around the world that are dying for their faith today. China, Iran, Nigeria other places where they are under very heavy persecution and they don't know whether they're going to wake up tomorrow because they may never make it to tomorrow. And so as we look at the church at Smyrna, we need to understand that's, I just want to stress that why we're studying it the way we are, okay, is that our goal is what? We want to learn from these churches. 
We want to learn from their victories. We want to learn from their defeats. We want to learn what we should be doing. Plus, we learn more about Jesus Christ. We learn about who he is, who he really is. And we also learn some of the great promises that he gives to all of us through these churches. Uh, Last week, like I said, we studied the, the church at Ephesus, okay? And you know, the church at Ephesus is a lot like, like, to be quite honest with you, they're a lot like our churches, okay? What I'm saying by our churches, I'm saying by conservative churches that are preaching the Word of God, okay? They, they were serious about serving God. They were serious about, they wanted to be right with God. They wanted to do what the Bible said. They wanted to live by the Bible, okay? And they were serious about it. And they were devoted to it. But they forgot one thing. They forgot their first love. It became mechanical, and it's one of the greatest dangers when you're talking about churches. Where, when, we're, when we're conservative, we're living by the Bible, we sometimes allow that to just become a religion, okay? And we don't need it to become a religion. We need to remember why we're doing it. Here again, it went perfect with last week. We were talking about motive. The motive is the love of God. And see, the church at Ephesus lost their motive. Their motive had turned to something that was weak, and God had told them to come back or, or he would remove their candlestick. And that's important to understand that God does judge churches. Okay? You know, you say, well, what, what happened to that church? God judged them. You know, now I'm not, I'm not here to determine which churches God judged, okay? I'll leave that in God's hands. But can I tell you, you see throughout history that God judges churches. He judges nations. He judges churches. He judges people. Okay, and so we, we need to understand he is actively involved in the world today. So let's get right into this and let's look at the church at Smyrna. So just a few things. The church at Smyrna is the suffering church. And uh, we see that as we read through that. But let's, let's consider a few things. I, I, just a little introduction to Smyrna. Smyrna was only 35 miles north, 35 miles north of the Ephesus along the Aegean Sea. Okay, so basically you have Ephesus and just a little bit up the coast in what we call Turkey today is the city of Smyrna. If you went, if you drew a line directly, just to give you an idea, if you drew a line directly to the west, you would be along the same latitude as the city of Athens on the other side of the Aegean. Okay, so very uh, kind of about midway, if you think about the bulge of Asia Minor, I wish I had a map, but about midway up there is the city of Smyrna. Okay. Now, Smyrna was like Ephesus. It was another very important port city. As a matter of fact, during the time that this letter was written, it was considered the second most important port city in, in the providence of Asia. That's what that providence at that time was the Roman providence of Asia. Okay? And so it was the second most important. Later on, just a few hundred years later, it became the most important because the harbor at Ephesus silted up and they could no longer use it. Okay? So it was very, very important. Um, it, was, it was also, uh, let me just look at my notes here. The city presented at the time of the writing of the letter had, had been proposed by Alexander the Great. Okay, so Alexander the Great was basically the founder of this city. It had had an ancient city, but it had been destroyed by the Lydians. And uh, so Alexander the Great wanted to rebuild it as a model Greek city. Uh, It was considered one of the most beautiful cities in all of Asia. a matter of fact, they, they took the claim that they were the first in Asia in beauty and size. Okay, during the rise of Roman influence, and this is important to us understanding what's taking place at this at this church at this time. During the rise of the Roman Empire, uh, the as the Greek Empire began to fall apart, they had been under the power of Pergama. Okay, which is another city we'll read about later as our study of the churches, and they broke away from Pergama. They rebelled against Pergama, and they asked the Romans. They asked the Romans to protect them. Now, when they did that, they also became devotees of the the cult of Rome. Now, you may not realize this, but they literally worshipped. By the time this letter, even before this, several hundred years before this, the Romans had come to a point where they literally worshipped the city of Rome. Okay? Then later on, a few, just a few, maybe a hundred years before this, they began to worship the Caesars. Okay? So this city was a devotee 
of the cult of Rome. And the goddess of Rome was Roma, okay, Roma. And then later on, after the Caesars came to power and they became also worshipers of the Augustian cult and then later on the other cults because basically they started deifying each one of their leaders in turn. And so they were very devoted to pagan worship of Rome in particular. Now, why is that important to what we're reading here? Because as part of that devoteness, the, the devoteness they had to the Roman cult, okay, they literally, they literally, each citizen of the city would have to make a commitment or basically worship the cult of Rome each year. In other words, they had to swear their allegiance to the cult of Rome each and every year. Well, you can understand that that was a problem for the Christians. They couldn't swear their allegiance to the cult of Rome. And for you to live in this city, for you to have a job in this city, to be able to function in this city, you had to swear your allegiance to the cult of Rome. And since the Christians couldn't do that, couldn't do that they came under severe persecution. So let's continue on from there. We've talked about a little about the city. Now I want you to talk about, we're going to talk about the gospel. How, do, how did the gospel reach Smyrna? The truth is we don't absolutely know, okay? We don't know how it got there. We do know, however, that there was a very large Jewish community in this city. It was very large. And so we know that the early gospels that spread, generally speaking, spread through the synagogues. And we also know that since it was so close to Ephesus, most likely if I was going to, if, I, if you were going to ask me, Brother Daniel, how do you think it got there? I believe it probably got there during the time that Saul, I should say Paul, was working in Ephesus. Because the Bible says that when he was at Ephesus, his enemies said that the whole providence of Asia had been reached with the gospel. And so it's even possible that Paul at some point had even traveled here during his time and in Ephesus, that he may have traveled there, or at least some of his party may have traveled to Smyrna and helped establish this church. Now, there's a lot of famous people that you would, the, the biggest one that most people might have heard of is Polycarp, okay? Polycarp was actually the pastor at the church of Smyrna. It's actually after this time, after this time of persecution, he also was, he died for his faith in Smyrna also. So that's the most famous person you would know off the top of your head. If you've studied uh, early church history, you may have heard that name. Okay, so we know that the biggest thing is we know that the gospel reached there because there was a church there. Okay, but I want to dig right into the message here. So let's look at the message to the church at Smyrna. The first thing we see in every one of these messages, they start off with a revelation of Jesus Christ. If you remember last week, we heard the revelation of Jesus Christ to the church at Ephesus was that Jesus Christ is the head or he is the control, he's the authority within the local church. Remember, he was in the midst of the candlesticks. Okay, he held the star, he held the stars in his hand. Okay, so he's in control. Today, let's look at what the Bible says, to, what Jesus said to this church. In Revelation 2 8, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. The description to the church at Ephesus emphasized Jesus' authority over the churches. The description to the church at Smyrna emphasizes. First, his inter eternality. He's the first and the last. And the second, and secondly, his power. Now think about this, why this would be so important to this church. His power over death. His power over death. So they reveal, they say, listen, Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. He's the first and the last. But then the emphasis is he has power over death. What was this church facing? Death. Death. That's why the revelation of Jesus Christ to this church emphasizes his power over death, his eternality. No doubt this was a comforting, this was a comforting message to this church, which was under severe persecution. We know from the passage that already some had died. And as we continue reading down, we find out that more are going to die. 
However, Jesus reminds them he has the power over death. So we need not fear what man can do. They cannot take, listen, this is what he was saying, they cannot take the eternal life I've given to you away. You cannot lose it. That's the first thing that Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, the suffering church. The second thing is we see he gives words of comforting, comfort to the suffering church. In his message to Smyrna, Christ does not give any negatives. Not one. He's, this is one of, there's another church, Philadelphia is the same way, but Smyrna in particular, he says nothing negative about this church. Have you ever thought about this? The persecuted, the persecuted church is a purified church. One person, I was reading it after one person, and they said, the problem with our churches today is that no one wants to kill us. I'm glad they don't want to kill us, but I'll be honest. So there are people who want to kill us, okay? But praise God, we live, we have freedom. But, but there is some truth to that. You know, why is Western, you know, you think about the inaugurists and what's going on in our countries nowadays. You know, with all this foolishness, you know, people who can't figure out what a woman is, what a man is, all this other stuff. That only happens, that only happens, it only ever happens in a rich, fat, lazy society. Because there's only people that have time for that kind of foolishness. If I go and I go talk to someone who's working hard for a living, they don't have time for that. If I go to people who are starving to death, do you think they're going to sit and argue that kind of stuff? No. No, they don't have time for it. And you know what? A church, if you want to see controversy in the church, it's because they've got nothing better to do. When we're serving God, when we're busy and it's serious, when it's serious, all the foolishness stops. You know, when, I, when I, I was in the military, I was in the Marine Corps for 10 years. I never had to, and I'll be honest with you, I had never had to do some of the things that these other men have had to do under fire and stuff. God preserved me. I, I was involved in several operations, but I did not have to, you know, I went to the first Gulf War. It wasn't very dangerous. I mean, I, it was, I'm not going to say there was no danger, but it wasn't very dangerous. But I can tell you when you go to war, People get serious, and they don't have any more time for foolishness. They have no more time to split hairs and argue about foolish stuff. Even though we didn't see a lot of combat, I can tell you our guys got really serious when we were going up to, into Saudi Arabia, and we didn't know what was going to happen. When the war kicked off and, and the, all the fighting started and the bombing and everything like that, nobody knew what was going to happen. It gets serious. It gets real. And that's the same way within the church. When persecution stops, starts, it gets real. The only thing that there's time for is the truth. You don't have time for extra stuff. It's just the truth. And so the, we see here the persecuted church is a purified church. Revelation, let's read these comforting words he gives to us. Revelation 2, 9 through 10. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blaspheme of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these, those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I want you to look, first of all, in the first verse that we just read. It says, I know you're suffering. You know what? There is nothing that we can suffer for Christ that he does not know. You know, sometimes it can seem like we're all alone. Sometimes it may seem like nobody cares, but can I tell you there's one that does. He's keeping track. He knows exactly what you're going through. And you say, well, Brother Daniel, I'm not suffering, you know, persecution unto death, but maybe I'm going through some other things in your life. Listen, God knows. He's promised to be with you. He'd never leave you or forsake you. That's what he's telling them. I know you're suffering. You see, first of all, it talks about their, their efforts to stand. He said, I know your works, talking about their efforts to stand for Christ in a city that hated them. That's tough. I think of Eduardo. I mean, Eduardo is my friend and 
he, you know, he often, he often, you know, it's difficult. He's there in a city where there's no very few other Christians, if any. It gets lonely. We need, you know, he needs to know that what? Christ knows. Jason and Angela are working down in Agliaro. There's in a big crowd. You say, we don't got a big crowd. You're right, we don't have a big crowd. But you know what? Christ knows. He knows your suffering. He knows your work. Second, he knew their tribulation or persecution. The word literally means, that word tribulation here is literally means to be crushed. To be crushed. Now this is very interesting because, and you'll see this throughout these letters to the churches, there's a lot of play on words. The word crushed, okay, they were under tribulation. Do you realize that the city of Smyrna, the name means myrrh? Do you know how myrrh, myrrh is a very fragrant, a very strong, fragrant spice that comes from tree resin? And it was traded throughout this area. They used it for worship in the temples and different things like that. They also used it in preparation for the body, okay, after death. Do you know how you got myrrh to smell? You crushed it. You crushed it. And you'll see this throughout these letters that you'll see these kind of connections with all these words. And God doesn't do anything by accident. And so literally to be crushed, their persecution, they were being crushed. But can I tell you, when they were crushed, they produced a sweet savor for who? God. Through their lives, it was a sweet savor unto God. And so he, he saw their persecution. It released, so we understand that it is so with the death of the saints. The Bible says that the death of the saints are precious in the eyes of God. He sees all of it. He also speaks of them being poor. Now this word poor, this poverty, you know, there's two types of words that are used in Greek to indicate poverty. One is you're poor and you're struggling to get through. That's where most of, you know, a lot of us are at. The poverty that is being spoken of here is absolute destitution. They had nothing. They were completely without any hope monetarily or economically. See, because this city was based on the worship of Rome, to be able to operate in this city, you had to swear allegiance to Rome. So when they refused to swear allegiance, they lost everything. They lost their job. They lost their homes. They lost their businesses. They lost everything they had. They were completely and utterly destitute. They had nothing left. See, the amount of stuff does not determine how close we are to God. This is a popular... Now, do, do I believe that God chooses to bless some people? Yes. And I, I think you should be thankful for that. But can I tell you, just because someone is destitute doesn't mean they're not blessed of God. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that many of the prophets had nothing. But yet, they trusted God. And God took care of them. You think about Elijah, the widow of Zareth. He was there. Did they have anything? No. They had a little bit of meal and they had a little bit of oil. So little, a matter of fact, that it was just enough to make one cake for the widow and her son to eat one little meal and then they were going to die. You know, Elijah comes along and he says, listen, make me a cake. She, by faith, stepped out and made Elijah a cake out of that meal. You know what? The Bible doesn't say that automatically her whole bin filled up with flour. It doesn't say that automatically she had, she had 50 gallons of olive oil in the back cupboard. No, that, that, that cruise of oil was always just ready to run out. And that barrel of meal only had enough for another cake. But you know what? God took care of it. They were destitute, but they were right where God wanted them, trusting him. And so God tells us, I know your suffering. The second thing he tells them is, I know what your enemies are doing to you. Has it ever seemed to you that the enemies of Christ are never punished? You know what I'm talking about? People live wickedly and they do evil and it just seems like they get away with it. You know, they, they, they abuse, 
They abuse the truth. They lie. They cheat. They steal. They attack Christians. And it just seems like they get away with it. Christ is telling the suffering church, your enemies are not getting away with anything. I know who they are and what they are doing. Remember, there was at Smyrna a large Jewish population. And once they rejected the gospel in this, the, go, the gospel message, they became the most hateful enemies of the church. Now, what was this church made up of? It was made up of Hebrew people. And I'm going to clarify here in a minute because he says they're not Jews, okay? Understand, Jews is actually talking about their faith, their religion. Hebrew is their nationality, okay? So there was Jews that had accepted Christ, they had accepted the message of the gospel, they were true Jews because they were truly following God. He's saying the false synagogue, the synagogue of Satan, okay, they were no longer, they were still, nationa their nationality was still Hebrews, but they had rejected what God had done. They had rejected their Messiah. And as a result of that, they were the most avid enemies of that church. Now, it's, it, there's a lot of things that we know about how these people, the Bible says that they blaspheme. What that means is to slander. It means to slander. It means to tear down. It means to make falsehoods about the church. And that's exactly what they were doing. And we know some of the falsehoods that the Jews used against the church. There's many things that they did. They, they claimed that they were cannibals. Why? Because they, because they had the Lord's Supper. Okay? They said that they were drinking and eating their founder. Okay? Now, that's not what the Bible says, but that's what they said they were doing. They claimed they caused economic problems because they stopped people from going to the temples. And the temples were a major source of income for these cities. They said they wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire because they worshipped Jesus as king instead of the Roman gods. Okay? Did Jesus advocate for the overthrow of the Roman Empire? No. They claimed they were immoral because they taught that we should love one another. And they said they were involved in perversion. And there's many other things they said. Now it's interesting because many of these lies which were told about the Christians to stir up the authorities against them are even to this day being used to attack the church. And you say, you're kidding me. No, when I went to Kyrgyzstan, I was told, yeah, oh, you're a Baptist. Oh, you drink, you, you kill babies and drink their blood. And you say, they still say that kind of stuff? Yes, they do. These same lies have continued on to this very day. So understand, God knows our enemies. And he knows what they're saying and they will be held accountable. Why, don't they, why doesn't he often hold them accountable now? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's long-suffering. But then I want you to understand the third thing I want to bring up about the comforting words is the words he says here, fear not, Christ is in control. If you look at the verse there, go back to our verse, it says in verse 10, fear none of these things, those things, which thou shalt suffer. This is a message to all of us. God allows these tribulations to come into our life. What does it say there? To try us, to build us up, to make us what Christ wants us to be. But he will not allow them to always be in our life. God first tells them more persecution is coming. But notice he also limits it. Now, I mean, that's pretty hard. I mean, you think about this. Here's this church. People are dying. People are suffering. People are absolute destitute. And then what, the first, what does he say? Fear not. There's more on the way. But it's only going to last 10 days. It's only going to last 10 days. It's not going to last 11 days. It's not going to last 12 days. It's going to be 10 days. Now, I know a lot of people have tried to figure out what, you know, what happened during this time. It, the Bible doesn't tell us. 
But what we do know is this, God is in control. Nothing in our lives can happen without God's permission. You say, why does God allow it? For His honor and His glory. We don't have to understand. Job was the same way. You remember Job? Did God ever tell Job why he did what he did? No. He said, Job, I'm God. I'm in control. I can do with you as I choose for his honor and glory. God isn't mean, but God allows things. You know what? You say, well, why is there suffering? Why is there persecution in the world? Why is it? It's not because of God. It's because of the sin of man. The sin of man brought persecution. The sin of man brought destruction. The sin of man brought perversion. God gave us a free will. But God limits what man can do to his children. He loves us and he has a purpose. He says, I'm in control. The fourth thing I want you to see about his words of comfort is, I will reward your faith. The reward promised is the crown of life. You find that right there at the end of verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This was a very special promise to these saints. The city of Smyrna was called the crown of Asia. It was called this because the city was built on the side of a hill. The streets followed the contour of the hill. It was kind of a round hill, and they followed the contour of the hill. And there was a street about halfway up, which was called the Golden Street. And that street, which was called the Golden Street, was the main street. And along that street were all the temples and all the big government, monumental government buildings and everything. So that when you looked at the city from out in the harbor and you looked up into the city, it looked like a necklace or a crown going around the hill. And so it was called the Crown of Smyrna. And you can look it up. It's in the history books. It's the crown of Smyrna. Okay? And because, so you understand that this city, it it was called the crown of, they had this very, they were very proud of this crown. That's why they called them first in Asia in beauty and size. So the, the Smyrnans were very proud of this. And so these Christians, as they are suffering and they are dying and they are being cut off from this city that was their city, God's promising them that he has something much better for them than what they're losing. They're losing their lives. They're giving their lives for Christ. And he says, I've got a crown that's a whole lot better than the crown of Smyrna. I've got a crown of life that you'll have for all eternity and you'll spend all eternity with me. You know, our lives, I'm not telling us to go out. You know, we, we, God has given us a desire to live. Otherwise, we'd all die and go to heaven, okay? <laughs> and be done with this life. But God's got a purpose for us here. But listen, let's not get so connected to this world that this world is everything to us that we forget that this life is just temporary. That yes, we should should work hard, we should do the things to honor God, but listen, this life is only like that. And what we have waiting for us is much better than anything we'll ever have here. Much better than anything that we will ever lose here. God was giving them a crown of life that would last through all eternity. So we've seen, as we've gone through, we've looked at the fact that the message, in the message we've seen the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've seen uh, the, the message of comfort that Christ gives to this church. And now we're going to look at the promise to the church. Each one of the churches ends, the message ends with a promise to the churches. Okay? And each one of them, just like all the rest of parts of the message, they they have a a really special purpose to the church it's written to, but also to us. If we look at that verse, it's in verse 11. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Each church, like I said, receives a promise that is special to them in their present circumstances but is equally precious to us. This member, the members of this church were dying for their faith, but they were promised that they could not be hurt or suffer the second death. 
What is the second death? If you turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, we will see what the second death is. It says, starting in Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are writ were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The second death is literal separation from God for all eternity in a very literal lake of fire. It will be suffered by all those who reject Christ. Praise God, we cannot suffer the second death if we have accepted Christ as our personal Savior. Our names are written down in the book of life. Remember what Jesus said, I know your enemies and I know what they do to you. You know, for, for the person who rejects Christ, the best life they're ever going to have is right here, right now on this earth. Because the second death awaits them in all eternity where they'll suffer for all eternity. God doesn't want them to go there, but they choose to go there. For us as Christians, as bad as it can get, our best life is not here. It's in eternity. Where we'll spend all eternity living with Christ. We don't even know what he has prepared for us. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Can I tell you, that's what God was telling this church at Smyrna. I know you're suffering, but it's only going to get better from here. I don't know what the Lord has prepared for us in the future here as far as in this world. The truth is the world is becoming a very dark place. There are people in this world, Nigeria, China, places like that, that places people are literally suffering for their faith and they're dying for their faith. It may come someday that we may be asked to do the same thing. Remember, God will be with you all the way. And even if they take our lives, they cannot take our eternal life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, I thank you for the folks that are here. Lord, I wish there were many more, Lord. Lord, not so that we could have big numbers, but Lord, so that many more would go to heaven to be with you. Lord, I have known some very bad people in my life, Lord. But Lord, you love them. And Lord, you want them to be saved. And Lord, you know my heart. Lord, I truly desire that they would accept you, Lord. Lord, because what is before them is more is worse than anything they could ever do to me. Lord, I pray that we would, first of all, see you and Lord, when we go through tribulation, when we go through trials, Lord, help us not to quickly get frustrated or give up. But Lord, keep our eyes on you. 
Lord, we know that you've promised to be with us even unto the end of the world. And Lord, in my experience, I know that's true. Lord, I know that you never leave or forsake your child. Lord, help us to trust in you. Lord, in the coming days and years, Lord, help us not to be ashamed of you. Help us to stand strong, Lord, for you. Help us to preach the truth. Lord, help us to be like the saints at Smyrna and to be faithful unto death. In Jesus' name, amen.